During World War I, a man named Manfred Albrecht von Richthofen was a famous German fighter pilot. Uh, most people would not recognize the name Manfred Albrecht von Richthofen, but many of us would recognize him by his nickname that he was giving during the war. We've come to know this individual as the Red Baron. During World War I, Richthofen shot down 80 enemy aircraft, more than any other pilot. He was called the Red Baron because he, he flew an airplane that was painted bright red. On October 12, 1918, Richthofen was chasing after a Canadian fighter pilot, and in the chase, he flew his red airplane too far into enemy territory and was shot down. Eyewitnesses who understood flight and combat said this, the Red Baron was flying way too low because most likely he was so fixated on chasing the other pilot that he lost sight of his bearings and didn't realize he had flown into enemy airspace. This chase cost him his life. Similarly, I see this, that we get caught up in chasing after this thing, after things that the world has to offer. Before we know it, we're way too deep into enemy territory and we get shot down spiritually. One of the things that I've observed that we as humans chase all too often is happiness. We encourage our families to pursue happiness as well, and I'm going to present to you over the next few moments that I think that that's to our detriment. The lie of happiness has caused much downfall. Now, I'm not a melancholy, down in the mully grubs, doom and gloom, spirit of Eeyore kind of guy. But I think happiness has its limitations, and I want to highlight those. Because I think this will make us a, a more well-balanced believer, a more well-balanced person. Um, one individual said this, Lolly Daskal says this, when you stop chasing the wrong things, you give the right things a chance to catch you. Um, we gather here today to look at the elusive pursuit that mankind has been engrossed in and engaged in for centuries the pursuit of happiness. Our nation is founded on this phrase, that we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But I want to remind you of something that I've said in the past. The government does not have the right to trump God's word. Okay? So just because they say you have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness doesn't mean they're correct. And the pursuit of happiness may not be the highest and best aim for our lives, and I want to make that case today. We hear this too often, and I felt it was important to discuss this during our series on, on family, because in my estimation, I can think of very few things that have destroyed more families than the lie of pursuing happiness. How plain can I be with you today? Like, can we like talk plain today? I've heard too many people say, I divorced my spouse, why? Because I wasn't happy. <laughs> I left my kids because I wasn't happy. I made this change because I lived my whole life never making any decisions that were making me happy. And I've often said to those individuals, who told you you were going to be happy? If you get married to make you happy, you got a problem. Every person who's been married in this room more than 15 minutes will tell you marriage is not the pursuit of happiness. It is the pursuit of selflessness. Who told you having kids was going to make you happy? They lied to you. You need to find them or write them a note and say, you did me dirty. You did me wrong. This is not my experience. Okay? Uh, there, <laughs> I felt it's important because it's distracting us from the more meaningful pursuits of life. There is a societal doctrine that tells us we're supposed to be, or we deserve to be, 
in a perpetual state of happy. And it's not true. It's not true. Why would you say that to me, Pastor Josh? Because I love you and I want to serve you. And if you believe that your life is to be measured against a temporary emotional state, you're going to live life confused, unserved, unsatisfied, and really on this weird roller coaster of chasing something that you're really never going to catch. Okay? And there's two lies about happy that I've noticed that I wonder if you've noticed as well. Number one, the first lie is that people tell themselves is, I'll be happy when, and then they fill in the blank. They set a goal. I'll be happy when I get here. I'll be happy when this happens. I'll be happy when that happens. It's futuristic, and you're postponing your fulfillment to a set of circumstances playing out the way you think they should. And I think this is a bad way to frame your life. Some people will say this, well, I'll be happy when I move out of my parents' house. I'll be happy when I graduate high school. I'll be happy, <laughs> sorry, I went too fast on the first one because some of you all have had that feel. I'll be happy when I move out of my parents' house. And I was happy for a few moments. Then I had to go to the grocery store, and then I got a utility bill, and then I got a mortgage payment, and then I got a car payment, and then I got an insurance payment for my car, and all these things piled up. I was like, you know what? They weren't that bad after all. <laughs> I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when I meet the right person. I'll be happy when I meet a different person. Can I say this to you? That so much of our distraction with happiness is connected to laziness. We don't want to do the work. Affairs happen because they think it's easier to be with someone else. Oh, I'm going to tell you the truth this morning, whether you like it or not. They, they, you think that someone else is better. You think, I wish I could just get someone else's kids. I wish I could just get a bigger house. I wish I could get a, big, a bigger car, a better car. I'll be happy when. And you won't. You won't. Because it's something inside that is the problem. It's a lie that we're believing. The futuristic sign of I'll be happy when just kicks the can down the road to an ever-moving set of goalposts that you never reach. The second line that I've noticed is this, is that whereas I'll be happy when is futuristic, the second lie is past tense. I can't be happy because. There's a subtle difference, and let's look at this one a little bit more closely. The first one seems justified because we're setting goals and we're achievement-oriented, and all oh, that's great, I get that. I, I, can, I can be that way too. But in the second one, we justify our lack of happiness because we loathe our, we're, we're like loathing in self-pity. I can't be happy because my parents didn't do this. My parents didn't support me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not funny enough. I'm not creative enough. I don't have enough money. I was wronged, and I can't be happy until the wrong is righted. Can I just say this to you? Stop waiting for an apology that you're never going to get to make you happy. Just freaking move on. You're dismissing my pain. No, I'm not. I'm trying to help you eliminate it. Because you were wronged, everyone in this room can say that. I could sit up here and tell you stories about how I was wronged by human beings until you go through every Kleenex of every box in this room. And you know what? It won't change anything. Now, you, now, now listen, I understand that people have gone through trauma and, and that, that they've been victims, but you do not have to allow the mindset of being victimized to invade your soul. We live in a society that's a reflection of the family that it's almost become, man, I don't know if I want to say it this way, but I believe it's true. Um, it's like we're celebrating and being a part of the victim Olympics. Like which of us has been suffering the most? Who's been wronged the most? Who's been victimized the most? And we've celebrated that victim state rather than allowing change to happen. And I guess, that, I guess I understand the temptation, but that 
the question that begs itself to be asks, asked is, do you want to leave your life in the hands of someone else's actions or opinions? And the best weapon we have against lies is the truth. We live in a culture that touts happiness as the ultimate goal, but here's the situation. Jesus doesn't tout that as the goal. There's no place written in Scripture that says, thou shalt be happy. <laughs> There's actually a lot to the contrary. You won't find anyone coming to Jesus saying, I'm not happy, and Jesus saying, oh, I can fix that for you. Let me just, because that's my aim in life is for you to be happy. You, you, you have to change your thinking. What does Jesus tout as the most important thing? The first one we've looked at. It's a firm foundation, a secure foundation. He's interested in this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock, built his life, built his home, built his family on a strong foundation. Notice the next one. The person who built their house on his words, they avoided all struggle and all difficulty, didn't they? He says, then thou shalt have no difficulty, no struggle, and everything will be perfect in your life. Is that what he says? He says, you're going to build your life on my words, and rain and storms are still going to come, and the reason your house is going to stand and it will not fall is because it had its foundation on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. A secure foundation is one of the things that Jesus celebrates. The second thing he celebrates is this, is I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Would you say this out loud? Would you say within them where is it within so why are you looking for it without why do i look for it on the outside no 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 this is an internal work so the difference that you have to see before we move on is happiness is external which is not promised joy which is promised is internal it's a shifting. I'm going to show you a couple formulas that I think will be helpful to you in just a moment. But let's continue reading. And he says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world. You and I are a different breed. We, we don't measure ourselves against the standard of the world system. We have a different standard that we measure against. For they uh, are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Watch this. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Can I say that last portion to you a little bit differently? God is more interested in you on earth than he is on you going to heaven. Heaven's an inevitable conclusion foregone for the person who's put their faith in Jesus Christ. But Jesus prays to his father and says, hey, don't take him out of the world. Leave them in the world because we need the ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven on earth. I don't need more ambassadors in heaven. There is no change that needs to take place in heaven. I need your influence on the earth, and that influence is attached to us having a fullness of joy on the inside. And if we're busy chasing happiness, then we don't walk in the fullness of his joy. We let go of our influence and we just have this mentality that says, one day in the sweet by and by, I get to get out of this place and this, this crusty, sorrow-filled, sad place and go someplace else. And he says, no, I want you on earth right now more than I want you in heaven because that's where you can affect some change. And you can do that through your family. I'm gonna give you some equations to maybe write down and consider. Um, th these, I know there's gonna be a lot of math for early in the day on a Sunday, but these are, these are important, I think. Um, some of these I've gone over before, but these are worth memorizing and writing down. Unmet expectations equals disappointment. 
So when you expect something and it doesn't happen or the opposite of what you expected happens, then you're disappointed. And disappointment is the lack of oxygen in your soul. It's the you can't breathe. It's the emotional blow that, that, that hurts. Um, let me give you an example of this. Uh, as a married person, I would expect my wife to remember my birthday. How many of you think that's a fair expectation? And if she, no one thinks that's a fair expectation. Okay, fair enough. I think it's fair. And if she were to forget that, it's my birthday, and I expected to get a gift, I would be disappointed. And you might be too. For Father's Day this year, so all of my kids now have jobs. So my expectation for Father's Day on a gift went way up. Yeah, I'm a man of faith. You walk by faith and not by sight. And this year, here's my faith. I believed that I received a better gift for Father's Day than my wife got for Mother's Day. That's where my faith was. Like, if you can do that for mama, you can do a little bit better for dad. Come on, somebody. Like, I'm tired of low living and low faith and doubt and unbelief. Like, let's get together and let's get with it, man. Like, let's get some stuff out of these kids that we've invested in. I'm not a poverty mindseted preacher, just so you know. I, don't, I did not take a vow of poverty. I did not. That's a whole other subject. So I'm like, I was clear. Here's what I want. I want a black stone, four burner, cast iron griddle. I want it put together, and I want it to have propane when it shows up, and I'll cook on it. That's what I wanted. That was my expectation, and I was not disappointed. So... I don't know if you're clapping for me or my kids, but they get the benefit because I cook on it and I do okay. But I had an expectation, and I'll tell you this side story. I gotta hurry because I'm gonna be out of time. They wanted to make it a surprise, so Audrey gave me a t shirt <laughs> first. <laughs> and it said, Best Pops. And it had a can of a soda on it, or a bottle of soda. I was disgusted. I was. I was disgusted. I didn't say it because I'm smarter than this, but I thought, if this is as good as it gets today, yeah, we're going to have problems. We're going to have problems. And I smiled and said thank you, and then she gave me these ice cube molds that are in the shape of a golf ball. And I thought, you love me a Walmart t-shirt and ice cube holder's worth? I'm just saying what you all think and feel, because I know this is the way we are as humans. And my, I was disappointed. I was disappointed, and then out came the black stone, and all of my disappointment left. So let me move on. The next equation that you need to know is this. Repeated disappointment. When you have an expectation that goes unmet over and over and over and over again, that's when you experience frustration. And your families, think about it. You expect them to do it, and you get irritated. You get frustrated. The, the next equation I think is worth memorizing is this. A bad circumstance plus a good outcome, a person feels relieved. Now, this is, these equations are my attempt at giving you language to discern life, okay? Um, I, I didn't steal these from anywhere. They're just kind of how I've interpreted life. And let me give you an example of this. Some of you have asked about my health, and my health is, is, is good, and um, a few months back, I, I went and had some tests done, and they had, I had a scan of different parts of my abdomen, and one of those parts was my kidney, because I was feeling like I was maybe getting a kidney stone several months ago. It, it wasn't. And um, so I said that to you because I left the appointment. I said, well, how long will it take for someone to get a hold of me? And the nurse said, um, it'll show up in my chart before your doctor gets a hold of you, do you have access to my chart? I said, yes, I do. And they said, well, be on the lookout in my chart for the results. So I'm like refreshing that thing over and over and over again to, to like, what, 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 what's going on, what's going on? And it pops up, report, scan report. I read it, and it says, um, lesion on kidney. I panic. I have cancer. 
I'm dead. I've done my funeral in my head already. I've, I've picked out the songs. I've picked out the Bible verses. I've picked out who's supposed to. Sp- I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to worst case scenario in lightning speed. Do I have anybody that does that in any shape, form? Like, I was like, no, I'm dead. I'm dying. I mean, we're, we're all dying, but like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be dead fast, right? I just preached a series on healing. The devil's trying to kill me. And so I'm like going through all this stuff in my brain, right? I'm going to be dead. It's not funny, but that's what I'm thinking. Bad circumstance. Doctor called and said, Josh, it's not a lesion. It's a, it's a little thing that people were walking around with all over the place. It's nothing to worry about. Good outcome. I was relieved. Does that make sense? The last one is this. Good circumstances plus a good outcome is how you get to happy. This is very rare. That's why we don't experience it. That's why it's not worth pursuing. Because your circumstances have to line up with your outcomes, and it's, and it's a momentary thing. I want to give you five reasons why um, happiness is limited and not worth building your life on. Number one, because it's fleeting. It's here for a moment, and then it's gone. It, it's, it's always running out of energy. You have to constantly recuperate and revive and... And, um, and work to get it over and over and over again. It, 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 in other words, it evaporates. It's a momentary state. It is, it, is, um, it is the emotional equivalent of a human being that's transient. They're never in the same place twice. They're always moving around. It's fleeting. Um, the, the, the second reason why it's limited is it can be blind, and it can blind us. Um, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a worthy thing to obsess over. And when we obsess over it and say, this is the measuring stick and standard by which we have to live our lives, when the inevitable difficulties come, when the guaranteed storms of life come, you're unprepared because you think in order to be pleasing to God that God's result is always for you to be happy. And if you measure that and say, that's how I know when I'm in God's will or God loves me is I'll be happy, you don't have a complete picture of how God operates. So, so blindness can, uh, happiness can blind us. Third is happiness can create complacency. What do, what do I mean? What do I mean by that? Um, there are certain seasons in the part of the world that we live in where neither heating or cooling is necessary at certain times of the year. Um, and so it's not, it's not hot enough to put on the air, and it's not cold enough to put on the heat, right? So it's comfortable in the daytime, but like especially in the fall I'm thinking about, um, it'll be warm enough in, the, in certain times in the fall where you don't need the air, but it can get quite chilly at night. Thank God for blankets and so on and so forth. Um, I've had this experience of it got cold at night, and I was bundled up and wake up and the tip of my nose is cold. So I know it's cold outside of the blanket. You ever been there? And you just don't want to get out of bed. You just want to stay right there where it's warm. That's happiness. You just want to stay right there. It, it creates complacency, which is the opposite of growth which is the opposite of progress. You, you just want to stay there and relish the warmth. That's what happiness does for us sometimes. And if we're not careful, if you'll let me meddle for just a couple of moments. Um, thank you. Um, what, what, what happens when we're raising our kids is we value happiness for them over everything and we mess them up. Let me give you a couple of examples. We say, when we're raising our kids, hey baby, I believe in you. You can do whatever you want. Just go and do whatever makes you happy. That is such bad, unwise advice. I'll give you a couple of reasons why. Anybody ever watched American Idol and seen the awful auditions? (laughs) They got on the stage because someone said, do whatever makes you happy, baby. Do whatever makes you happy. You can do anything you want. No. 
no, no. He says, well, that's, why, why would you say that? Well, if you look at a biblical context, Jesus says this, broad is the path that leads to destruction and narrow is the road that leads to life. So in a sense, what Jesus is saying is, the further you go in him with him as the center, the less options you have available to you. But we live in a world that celebrates options. And options are killing us, and let me just tell you, because I love you, okay? Let me serve you. Too many options are killing your family and your kids. How do I mean that? I'll give you an example. Many of you are going to do this. Some of you have already done it. What sounds good for lunch today? And if there's more than one person in that conversation, you're going to have a bunch of different answers. And parents, let me just help you. If you're trying to get consensus on what's for lunch today, stop. Just make a choice and go. Well, that seems a little dictatorial. Nope. You're paying. You choose. It's not rocket science. Oh, baby, what do you want for lunch today? Well, I want, and one kid wants a grilled cheese and tomato soup. The other kid wants cereal. The next kid wants filet mignon with a twice-baked potato. You all got that kid. I know you do. Somebody's got that kid, that bougie kid that wants everything their way. Somebody else, somebody else wants fried chicken. And so mom or dad will go to all the different restaurants to make everybody happy, and you're screwing that kid up. You're screwing them all up at the exact same time. I know that's strong, and some of you are going to get mad at me, but I don't really freaking care because I'm helping you to understand that's not how real life is. And if you train them that everyone's going to cater to their desires, you're setting them up to fail in the real world because the real world will punch you in the mouth and walk away and not apologize. That's the world we live in. And so, huh, okay. It can, uh, it can create complacency. Uh -huh. Am I saying, and, and here's why many of us do that. Because our parents didn't give us choices. And so we want to correct their behavior. Well, my parent, and you're postponing, well, I can't be happy because mommy didn't let me pick out the kind of cereal I liked and made me eat cornflakes and wouldn't even give me sugar for it. That's my real life. I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> I hope I'm doing a good job of helping you see that happiness is not the aim. And if you train your kids and your family that happiness is the goal, you'll set them up, watch this, for spiritual failure because I've often received direction from God that did the opposite of make me happy. It caused sorrow. But watch this. Happiness obscures the value of sorrow. There is value in sorrow. Let me read a verse of scripture to you that shows you that. In Romans chapter five, it says this. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. You know right away, Paul was not a citizen of the United States of America. Because some of you would have rather heard me cuss than say sometimes you have to suffer. Because we're Americans and we don't suffer. We get what we want. Some of you are all choked up about it and squirt them in your chairs right now. Why do we glory in our sufferings? Because we know that suffering produces something of value. Suffering, even though we don't like it, it's a matter of fact in life. It's a reality that it produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. Sorrow is a necessary experience in life. It teaches us to empathize with others. It's in our moments of struggle that we learn to understand what pain feels like so that we can adequately serve other people and how to appreciate other people's struggles. It can lead us to self-discovery. It can lead to introspection. It can produce a kind of profound understanding that you'll never find if you only ever strive to live in a perpetual state of happiness. Many of you know this story that my, 
my mother passed away um, over a decade ago. And um, the day my mom died, I did not experience happiness. I experienced sorrow. And many of you who've experienced loss have experienced the same thing. It's a weird response to death to be happy. I don't mean this to be a joke. It could be funny, but I don't mean it that way. If someone you know dies and your emotional response is to be happy, I'm guessing you didn't care about them if you're relieved that they're gone. I'm saying that because sorrow is the reminder that someone or something of value that we loved left us. And that's an emotional response that matters. It matters as much as happiness. That they were here and we cared and they left. And if all you want is happiness, you'll miss out on so many things that you can be taught by your family. Daniel, I'm going to finish with these couple things. The last one is happiness is subjective. Happiness is subjective. In other words, what brings you joy doesn't bring everyone else joy. Have you noticed that? It's, 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 it's a matter of opinion on happiness. L let, me, let me give you just a quick example of this. When we make happiness the primary objective, it can be a frustrating endeavor because it, it lacks a clear, universal definition or pathway forward. It's subjective. I'll give you an example. My wife likes to go garage sailing. That brings her happiness. I can't stand it does not bring me happiness. What it does though is, it reminds me to experience the joy that's within because someone that I care about is enjoying something that they enjoy, right? I don't get it in my, I don't get it. I, I don't, I don't get it. I'm like, baby, don't you understand? This stuff that they put out on tables, it's the last stop before it goes in their dumpster. <laughs> that's, how I, that's how I view garage sale stuff. It's like, come buy the stuff that I'm getting ready to let Shackleford take away. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> come give me money for the stuff that's going to be. <laughs> one man's trash is another man's treasure. But I think it should be one. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. I don't want to go down the gender specific path. Um, so. It brings her happiness, but it's subjective. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because that tells you that happiness is limited because it is subjective. It's not an eternal truth. There's no one thing that everyone can look at and agree, this makes me happy. But you can take certain things that we won't have time for today, and you can take certain things and, and, and say, this one thing will bring you joy, which will last and surpasses understanding and eclipses, um, eclipses opinions. It overshadows all of those things. So I'm going to finish with this, um, with a question. So what, what is life about if it's not about chasing or pursuing happiness? I propose to you this as an answer can't be a total answer, but I'll tell you what a good replacement is for happiness. I propose that life is not about the pursuit of happiness, but it's about the pursuit of wholeness, being complete. I believe it works out this way that God's word plus God's way plus any circumstance plus any outcome plus a biblical mindset, that's your journey to wholeness. That's a lot. That's a lot of math for noon on a Sunday. 
I'm going to spend all of next week talking to us about wholeness because this is what I believe. Wholeness is greater than happiness. Why do I think that? I think that because of what Paul says to the church at Thessalonica. He says this this in a prayer. He says, may God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he will do it. If he said it, he will do it. Have you ever felt like God doesn't hear you? That your voice hits the ceiling like the heavens are closed? I've felt that way too. Hello, my name is Josh Pennington and I would love to share with you how I navigated the dry seasons of life in my brand new book called When the Heavens Seem Closed. You can get this book anywhere that books are sold online or at morelifechurch.com. I would love for you to plan a visit to worship with us any Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. at More Life Church.